الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي قصرت عن رؤيته أبصار الناظرين وعجزت عن نعته أوهام الواصفين الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين وبالقاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد لما سأل يهودي أن وجه تسمية بمحمد وأحمد وأبي القاسم وبشير ونذير وداع قال أما محمد فإني محمود في الأرض وأما أحمد فإني محمود في السماء وأما أبو القاسم فإن الله يقسم يوم القيامة قسمة النار فمن كفر بي من الأولين والآخرين ففي النار ويقسم قسمة الجنة فمن آمن بي وأقر بنبويتي ففي الجنة وأما الداعي فإني عدو الناس إلى يوم الدين ربي إلى دين ربي وأما النذير فإني أندر بالنار من عصاني وأما البشير فإني أبشر بالجنة من أطاعني سلوات بيجي محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Indeed it is a sad night a night in which we commemorate two very important personalities in the history of Islam Unfortunately the inclement weather did not permit many to take part but inshallah we will try and focus tonight in a brief time that I have under this hadith that I recited in which Rasulullah was asked by a Jewish person in regards to the names and the titles that he possesses. He was asked, why were you named Muhammad? Why were you named Ahmad? Why were you given the title Abil Qasim or Abul Qasim? Why were you known as Nadir? Why were you known as Bashir? Why were you known as Da'i? Prophet replied to every single one of them. He said, the reason I'm named Muhammad is because I'm praised on the earth. The reason I'm named Ahmad is because I'm praised in the heavens. The reason I'm named Abu Qasim is because God has divided the hereafter into two parts one of them is comprising of jannat whoever believes in me and adheres to or admits my nubuvat will enter the paradise the second part the second qismat of the hereafter is in the form of a hell and whoever does not believe in me steers away from my teachings will enter the hell as far as my name Nadir is concerned, I'm there to go ahead and warn people. As far as my name Bashir is concerned, I'm there to give glad tidings to everyone. And as far as my name Da'i is concerned, is the reason because I call upon the people towards the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see that it is indeed a very important matter, a personality who affects each and every one of us getting to know Prophet and not just getting to know his life that he lived 1400 years ago 
getting to know that life which affects us today still. You want to be able to focus on the concept as to how he was able to bring that society which was touching the lowest asfal as-safilin, the lowest point in their you know, nation, in their history, how was he able to bring a revolution in them? Yes, Prophet possessed miracles, but he did not use miracles to bring these people out of this dungeon. It was pure character that Prophet portrayed and showed in front of the people. And that's one of the things that we want to focus on tonight as well. That to convert the society which is filled with evil and to bring them out where he's saying kuntum khayru ummatin. To make them to be the best of the nations. And that formula still is applicable today. Where unfortunately Muslims are not referred to as the best of the nations. Or Muslims are no longer referred to be the best of the people. And that is entirely lying upon us for the sake of our actions and not being able to adhere and, trans and transform those actions the Prophet has taught us and to be able to implement into our daily life. That is the main reason behind it. We see that the society which was worshipping idols, Surah Nuh, verse number 22, calls upon these people by saying, وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاعًا وَلَا يَعُوثًا يَغُوثًا وَلَا يَعُوقًا وَلَا نَصْرًا there were idols all over. If you go to Taif, you will find an idol in the name of Lot. If you come to between Mecca and Medina, you will find an idol by the name of Manat. Just outside of the skirts of Mecca, you will find an idol known as Hubal or Uzza rather. Inside Masjid al-Haram, you will find Hubal. On the Mount Safa, there was a male idol. On the Mount Marwa, there was a female idol. And these people were naming their children after these idols. Abd Uzza, Abdullah, Abd Manat, and so on and so forth. This is the level of the aitiqad and the belief system of this society. Where they're comparing these things, and inshallah we will give. Examples how Prophet is bringing these people out of this darkness. And so Prophet utilizes a unique method which we will inshallah divide in four parts that we want to discuss tonight. So this is the level. First I just want to give what level the society is at and then compare that level to the, the level that we are at right now. The society which was calling upon their deceased and comparing and bragging and being proud of when the ayat of Quran says, "Haqum al-takathur hatta zurtum al-maqabir," when Amir al-Mu'minin in Nahjul Balagha, when he, Sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad, mentions this ayah, and then he talks about how these groups or these tribes were bragging about their force, about their power, about the number of people they had, to the extent. That they will start counting how many people they have in their tribe. And then they will go ahead and visit the graves. To go ahead and count how many of the deceased do we have and how many of the deceased do you have. And for that matter they will go ahead and have bloodshed and wars. Imagine two groups and two tribes comparing each other's power. To the extent that they're counting family members. They're counting what we have done. What you have done. Counting what we have possessed in the wars. What you have possessed in the wars. This was the level where these people were at. Not only just that. They were counting the qualities of their spouses. To go ahead and show their pride among the people. Allahu Akbar. This is the level where the society is at. How does Prophet fix all of this? With all the trouble that Prophet had to go through. With all the harassment the Prophet had to go through. In fact, he's the one who's saying, Ma udhiya nabiyun, mithl ma udhiyit. There's no Nabi, there's no Prophet who was harassed and taunted. And the one who was troubled more than I was troubled. 
ma uziya nabiyun no prophet was harassed the way i was harassed there must be something that prophet is trying to mention otherwise prophet would not make such a claim this is where we see that we we will divide this into four different sections so that it is easy to follow along as well first is the way prophet performs his tabligh among the names of the prophet that we mentioned he is muhammad he is ahmad he is abul qasim he is nadir and bashir bashir and nadir are the two qualities that have been mentioned in quran in fact some riwayat mention that you know prophet is saying or was told by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give glad tidings to those who are sinners and warn those who are the good doers the question right away arises oh allah good doers you would be giving them glad tidings sinners you would be giving them warning but it's the opposite he said no warn the good doers and give glad tidings to those who are the sinners this is the lord about whom we read man sabaqat rahmatuhu ghadaba whose mercy exceeds his anger he says why he says because the good doers they should not develop the habit of taking bragging and pride about their actions to keep on warning them of the good actions that they're doing and to sinners keep on reminding them the glad tidings of the hope in the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they can always return back and repent to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so give glad tidings to those who are sinners not so that they increase in their sins now give them glad tidings in a sense that there is still a door open for you well as far as the good doers are concerned warn them lest that they become bragging and boasting about the actions that they have performed and all is nullified in the bargah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is where the concept of habt and takfir comes into play which ulama uh, kalam or the, the the discussion the scholars of kalam has mentioned this towards the end of ilm kalam they talk about these two concepts habt and takfir habt is where you do something and then you brag about it right away that action is considered to be nullified quran talks about it in surah hujurat it says you know ya ayyuhallazina amanu um you know la tuqaddimu bayna yadayhi allah wa rasulihi and towards the second ayah talks about la tarfa wa aswatakum fawqa sawti an-nabi do not exceed upon rasulullah and the teachings and the things that he has given you do not raise your voices over the voice of rasulullah and tahbata amalukum lest your actions are nullified lest your actions are destroyed this is where we see a perf- an action performed in secrecy that has the highest reward but if a person mentions that allah says i still reward you but now it is considered to be an openly done action so either you can help someone secretly or you can help someone openly when you help them secretly there's a bigger reward for it when you help them openly there's a lesser reward for it but if you had helped someone secretly and then mentioned it allah will still reward you but counted among those actions which you have done openly and then you mention it again this is where it becomes habt it's no longer written in your namai amal it's removed from these records of ours same way the concept of takfir not the takfir that we hear these days the factory of takfiriyat and what not rather the takfir coming from the concept of kafara what is kafara when you do an action come perform an action but is lacking something you go ahead and give kafara that action is completed so likewise you could have an action which is done incomplete but later on completed but then sometimes we have done an action perform something good indeed but we can go ahead and nullify that altogether so this is where the concept of habt and takfir comes into play lest we do something that are actions that we have done and the being in the concept of habt and no longer accepted in the bargah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala salawat bhej muhammad wa ali muhammad So the concept of bashir and nadir is very important and could be looked at from the aspect of how we deal with each other as well 
And especially the parents, especially the children and that relationship. That if there's all love coming from the parents, love will make the child, from the very beginning, all you have given is love to the kid. There's nothing wrong with that. But even in those places where you should have stopped and had been strict, you showed love. What that does makes this child too dependent. Even when this child grows up, is depending on others. Will never be able to become completely independent. Depending only on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it will always be depending on others. That's what too much love does. Mother might be doing or presenting or you know, showing too much love. Because it is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to her instinctively. But that also has to have limit. Love gives tawakkuat. Muhabbat leads to tawakku. Muhabbat leads to them depending expectations. So the expectations will remain even when the child grows up. But those who are always scolding, their parents, certain parents, they're always scolding. There's no love, none whatsoever. That is also bad. What that does, that brings stubbornness into the kids. It says indeed in a hadith, it says, Al-Firatu fil malamati yashubbu nairan al The word lajajat, we use in Farsi or in Urdu, means stubborn. That when you scold someone too much, and when you're always scolding someone, what does that bring? That brings stubbornness. So you got to have a balance between the two. Love and as well as the scolding or as far as being strict is concerned. So in some areas, yes, deal with love. But in many areas, you got to show the strictness. Otherwise, you will run into this problem because love will definitely be leading towards tawakkuat and expectations. And being strict all the time will make this child to be stubborn. Salawat Deji Muhammad wa Muhammad Prophet is living in a time when even killing children, their own children, is sort of like a fantasy for the people. Quran talks about it. Surah An'am, verse number 137 says, It is decorated for many of these mushrikeen to, you know, killing of the children. It, were, it was something of a fantasy for them. And also you read in Surah Taqweer, قُتِلَتْ What was the purpose and the reason that they, what were their sin that they were killed, these girls who were buried alive. This is the society. This is where Prophet has to come in and be Bashir and as well as be Nadir from both ends. It says, tell those people who are committing such acts to be Nadir with them, but also you could be Bashir with them as well. You can treat both of these problems with either way. But the hadith is saying, tell the sinners, give them good glad tidings. Why? There's still a door open for them. The door of hope, the door of making tawbah and coming back to the barga of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second method over here, I'm going through this very quickly. But before I get to the second method, you know, we need to also appreciate sometimes and not just sometimes, many of the times when it comes to the good deeds that are performed by anyone, especially the children in the house. Prophet was always doing that, encouraging, appreciating. If you do see a good act being performed by someone, even if it be something very, very simple or obvious or minor, still go ahead and appreciate that. Why? That is something which encourages and brings love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into these people. So if a child is praying, no matter how they're praying, you know, appreciate that. When you appreciate that, that will increase the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this child's heart. Unlike some people, you know, if a child starts praying, or if the child starts growing beard, or if a child comes to masjid too often, right away they start scolding them. What has happened to you? Have you become a, become a Malavi? Have you become a Mullah? You know, leave that to those people only. Or leave that to your, you know, elderly age. This is not the time for you to be doing any of these things. Right away we're discouraging. You'll find a lot of discouragement in our society. And you'll find very little appreciation. And you'll find very little encouragement. 
And that has to come from the family members as well, from the household as well. You know, yes, this is the institution where you learn and understand, and this is the institution where you develop these skills. But the house is the first darsga, first institution. So appreciate. If you see an action, even if it may be very little, go ahead and appreciate. There are different means of appreciating. Sometimes it is just by words. Sometimes by it's by hugging someone. Sometimes by rewarding someone. There are many ways of appreciating. Especially the children when it comes to them appreciating. Money works the best. So that would be one way of appreciating if they have done something. You're not measuring their act. Rather you are appreciating what they have done. And that will in later on longer run. Go ahead and increase the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into their hearts. Salawat bhiji Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Second method the Prophet used. Remember the society, the, the sketch that I had drawn in front of you initially, which you all are aware of, nothing new in it. The second method that Prophet is utilizing is reminding them of God's favors. Constantly reminding them of God's favors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends wahi on Hazrat Musa wassalam, and tells him, make people attractive, to, attractive towards me. So that people are attractive towards me. They're attracted in liking me. Attracted in worshipping me. He says, how do I do that? Allah replies by saying, remind them of my favors. Reminding them of my favors is something which will bring them close to me. Unfortunately, what Muslims are doing today is creating a hatred towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not just Muslims, even other religions have done the same thing. But we can care less of what they have done. Our duty is to bring people towards closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But by creating this image of God being a scary creature or something, we're scaring people away from it. No. Go ahead and show them the benefits and the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you. Logically speaking about those favors. And we'll get to the logical aspect of it, which is the third aspect of prophets propagation or the third method of prophets are um, you know propagation quran talks about that famous ayah in surah al imran which is in regards to unity twice in this ayat allah subhanahu is talking about what ni'mat his favor he says first I did favor to you by uniting your hearts because you were enemies of one another. Second, I did favor to you. I made you brothers in faith. You went from being enemies Twice in this ayah, Surah Al-Imran 103, Allah is talking about the ni'mat. We've learned to develop the akhlaq of Allah and the akhlaq of Rasul. One of the things is to not remind others of the favors. Allah is reminding of his favors twice over here. He can do that. You and I are told not to remind the favors that we have done to others. The concept of haft that we talked about. But Allah can mention that. Because why can't we mention the favors that we have done to someone else? Because it is not us who are doing this favor. It is indeed the tawfiq that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us that we are doing these favors. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves all the credit in that regards as well. So we can't take the credit over there either. Twice he talks about, وَعَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ عَدَانَ We are the first ones to go ahead and mention the favors that we have done. But we're never going to go ahead and mention the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done. What have I done? What have I done? I have done this. I have done this. I have given this. I have given that. We're counting countless favors that we have done towards others. Towards this religion. Towards the betterment of the religion, for example. But we're not counting it from the other end. This is where we see that one of the battles, the battle of Hunayn, which was the first battle that takes place after the conquest of Makkah. There was a lot of uh, ghanaim, booty of war, that was uh, you know taken in. 
says about 6,000 you know, camels or 6,000 animals were captured among the, the booty of war. That was the, the, those were the things. Either it was weapons or it was the animals that were captured and that was then dispersed among the people. Prophet goes ahead and gives all of these to the people of Mecca. To the extent that he gave 100 camels to each person. Among those who were the leaders over there, he gave 100 camels to each person. These people in the history are known as Ashabul Mi'a. The companions or the Ashab of 100. Ashabul Mi'a. Because they were given each 100 camels. Now people in Medina, the Ansar, are now feeling a little jealous, a little neglected, a little overlooked. Prophet gave everything to the people of Mecca. He didn't give anything to the people of Medina. He said, we battled alongside with him in Badr. We were there in the battle of Uhud. We were there in the battle of Khandaq. We fought all of these wars side by side, Prophet. We were the ones who provided shelter to him when he came to Medina. All of these favors, they're reminding what they have done, what they have done, what they have done. Now, Prophet could turn around and say the same thing, that didn't I bring this religion to you? Didn't, weren't you weak? I brought you out of that weakness. I made you strong. Haven't I done all of these things for you? He could have done the same thing. But how does he alleviate this concept that they have developed, that Prophet overlooked them? And he's favoring the Meccans over the Medina. Now obviously the Muhajireen and Ansar, some of the Muhajireen will be feeling the same way. But majority of the Ansar were feeling this heat that we were overlooked. Prophet comes to them and says, what do you really want? Me or the booty of war? Right away, Prophet is presenting something in front of them that they can't say, and they can always, they're always going to say, we want you, of course. No matter what kind of wealth you bring in front of us. May it be coming from their heart or else. But still, if uh, unfortunately, hopefully, we are not put through such a test in our life that when we have to, you know, decide between this and that. <laughs> Prophet said, what would you rather have? All this booty of war or me? Right away, people replied, of course, you. Nothing can be compared to you. This is where Prophet reminded them. Look, the reason I'm giving them everything is because they have just recently, after, this is the first battle after Fatih Makkah. Their hearts are still, you know, not as strong as yours. So by showing compassion towards them, by favoring them more, I want to be able to attract them towards the religion. I want to be able to attract them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what you have is me. I will be in your city. I'm not going to remain in Mecca. I will come to Medina. I will live with you. And I will die in your city. And I will be buried in this city. What would you rather have? Me? Or would you have this worldly things? They consider this hayat of dunya, the worldly things to be more or the superior to that which is in the hereafter. This is where how Prophet ﷺ was able to unite these people or able to bring them back by mentioning the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salawat Deji Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Third is the awakening the conscience. Just go Urdu me kenge vijdan ko bedar karna. To awaken the conscience of the people. They give them logical explanations. Our religion, alhamdulillah, everything that we have in our religion is according to the logical explanations. Although we don't require logical explanations as far as our religion is concerned, but everything is based on the concept of logic. And therefore, we should not have any problem mentioning any of our practices to anyone. I will mention that, inshallah, tomorrow as well in more details. But when Hazrat Ibrahim والسلام, when he broke those idols, right away these people they came and says, Anta fa'alta hada bi Is it you who has done this to our Lord? What was the reply of Hazrat Ibrahim? He replied by saying, Qala bal fa'alahu qabiruhum. Hada 
فَسَعَلُهُمْ إِنْ كَانُوا يَنْتَقُونَ The big one did it. Go ahead and ask him if he can speak. He left that big one alive or standing for that purpose right away. He said, go ahead and ask. These people themselves were laughing and sort of saying, they can't talk. They can't speak. So you're relying on something which is unable to defend itself. This is how you awaken someone's conscience. A lot of people at that time, yes, the majority were the followers of Namrud. They threw him into the fire that they had built. But a lot of the people, they right away realized this was the most rational answer that they could have gotten. Hazrat Ibrahim went on breaking their idols, but left one of them and said, go ahead and ask if it can answer back. Of course it cannot answer you back. When it can't even answer and defend itself, how is it going to go ahead and defend you? And then there were many other examples in this regards where people came and said weird stuff. For example, a person came to Prophet and said, I'm afraid I will commit adultery with someone in the community over here. Right away, some of the men, some of the people got offended. And Prophet, this is how he reminded them. Think about this, about your own namus. Think about this, about your own izzat and honor and respect. What if someone else thought this way about you and your izzat and your honor? Right away, this person was able to come out of this mentality, the thinking the way that he had. This was the third method. I'm going through it very quickly because I just looked at the clock and I'm running out of my time. Lastly, the method of tamthil and tashbih. Tamthil means giving examples. Tashbih means resembling things. He gave examples which were right in front, which were obvious, which were logical. Quran is the one teaching us how to give examples. In Surah Luqman, we read the same thing. It says, هَذَا خَلْقُ اللَّهِ فَأَرُونِي مَاذَا خَلَقَ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونِهِ When they were saying, comparing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the idols, He says, this is what my Lord has created. Go ahead and show me what your lords have created. You know, giving examples that are right in front of the people. Go ahead and show me what your Lord has created. But they were unable to go ahead and present. Prophet also gave examples. For example, he said, if they were to, لَا وَضَعُ الشَّمْسَ فِي يَمِينِ وَالْقَمَرَ فِي يَسَارِ عَلَىٰ أَنْ أَتْرُكَ هَذَا الْأَمْرَ مَا تَرَكْتُهُ If they were to put sun on my right hand and moon on my left hand, and to bribe me by saying that leave this affair or leave this amr and this matter, I will never leave this matter alone. I will keep on propagating. Someone might come and say, Prophet is speaking superficial. He's given examples of sun and the moon, which are not in his possession. No, Prophet does not give examples of things that are not in his possession. He's actually giving them the actual, he's not speaking figuratively. He's speaking literally. He says, I'm the one who has breaking this, broken this moon into half. Have you forgotten? My wali, my successor is the one who is able to return the sun back after it has set. So these examples are not superficial. These examples are not something which not in front. The Prophet, when he gives examples, when he gives tamthil and tashbih, these are always right in front. He says he shakes the stem of the tree. And when all the leaves fall out, he said, this is how your sins fall out when you go ahead and repent in the bargah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Use these examples. This is what Prophet did. This is the fourth method of propagation to bring these people out of the darkness and bring them towards light. Salawat bihiji Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Prophet was perfect as Quran talks about it. That uswatun hasana, if you want to look for it, from all aspects of the life. Not just the spiritual aspects of the life. Even from the physical aspects of the life. Unfortunately, we believe that the, you know, the person who is the least attractive is the most ascetic. No, that is not the case. Prophet would go ahead and you know, clean himself and to present himself in an attractive manner. He would apply perfume, he would in fact look into the water to look at his reflection, to fix his hair and to fix his amama for example. This is how he would go outside. He doesn't need to prove anything to anyone, but he's showing that this is how, this is what my seed, this is how I present and uh, interact with people. 
You want to be able to make yourself presentable. But unfortunately, we believe the, the least attractive we are, the more ascetic we are. The zuhada of our community, those who reach little levels of you know, zuhad or asceticism, right away they will, in other words, you know, refrain from any worldly things. Because that is just haram upon them anymore. Quran says, Lema to haram. Why do you make those things haram upon you which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal upon you? So Prophet in this regard is also is a perfect example that he takes care of himself. He does not go out without, for example, you know, putting on clothes which are presentable, which are attractive. Without combing his hair, for example, without fixing his amama, for example, any of these things. These are very small examples, brothers and sisters, which we see, which we find from the seerat of Rasulullah. And so therefore we see that he divided three uh, sections in his life, in his house rather. First was a section of ibadat. One part of his life or in his house life, it was ibadat. Second was dedicated for his family. Nothing else would be done when he's dedicating that part for the family. Third was dedicated for the people of the community. In other words, one is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, all of those, these parts are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you are dedicating a part for your family, that is also for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you are dedicating a part for your community members, that is also for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is how Prophet has managed three parts in his life. One part for worshipping God. Second part, for only for the family. Third, to the community members. In regards to this community members, and I'm sure you've, you hear this a lot, but this is how important it is. He says this in regards to the community. He says, وَأَبْلِغُونِ حَاجَةَ مَنْ لَا يَقْدِرُ عَلَىٰ إِبْلَاغِ حَاجَتِهِ فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ أَبْلَغَ سُلْتَانًا حَاجَةَ مَنْ لَا يَقْدِرُ عَلَىٰ إِبْلَاغِهَا he said, in regards to the community members, the one who brings the hajat of an individual to the leader, the one who does not have the means to bring his own hajat to the leader. For example, there's a person who is unable to reach the leader. That was not the case with Rasulullah, fortunately, that everybody was able to reach him. He was accessible. Masumin were always accessible. Unlike the leaders of the world today, you know, no matter, no matter, aside from their security point of view, you still have to go through a lot of means to reach them. And it's impossible. But prophets were not like that. Masumin were not like that. They were reachable. But it's still prophet says, the one who brings the hajat of the person who's unable to reach the sultan, what happens to this person? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the step for, steps firm on the day of judgment, in the day of qiyamah. This is the reward for the person who brings the hajat of a person who is unable to bring his own hajat to, for example, Rasulullah. Although Rasulullah was always, always accessible in this regard. Prophet was sent as rahmatan lil alameen, rahmat and the mercy for the all of mankind. And this is where we see in regards to many areas of his life. One of his wives, her name is Safiya. Safiya is Safiya bin Tahayy ibn Akhtab. She was captured after Khaybar, belongs to a Jewish family. But when Hazrat Bilal was bringing these women along them, among them was Safiya as well. He brought them and went past the place where the dead bodies of their, for example, family members was there. After battle, these women were captured, or these people were captured, and there were dead people, obviously, all over. And so he brought them, and he went past their deceased. Imagine you've been captured, imagine you've been beaten, and then you're made to pass through the same place where your deceased are laying dead. And this is where obviously it brought hardship upon them. When they entered upon Rasulullah, this was the first thing she said to him. He said, this is where we were made to see the deceased and dead. Those were our family members. Yes, they were your enemies, but they were still our family members. Prophet scolded Bilal at that time saying, why did you do such a thing? 
This is where Prophet said to her, the different rivayat, one says he said to her, if you embrace Islam, you have a choice in front of you. We will welcome you. And if you don't, we will send you back to your homeland. Looking at this, you know, Rahmat and the, the mujassama of Rahmat, the embodiment of Rahmat in the form of Rasulullah. Looking at this akhlaq of Rasulullah. And some rivayat said, Prophet said, because she was a captive, she was an asir, she cannot be freed like this. Prophet said, I'll marry you and then I'll free you. Prophet married her, wanted to free her. She said, no, I don't want to be freed. I would rather have this than to be freed and go back to my own place or my, go back to my own homeland. I would rather stay over here. This is how Prophet attracted people and then took care, gave them an open choice. You don't have compulsion if you want to embrace this religion. You can go back to your own religion if you want to. But if you come to this religion, yes, all of these things are waiting for you. This is the akhlaq of Rasulullah. When we talk about the akhlaq of Rasulullah. And then Fatimakka happens. And the other wars that took place. After all of these wars, people were claiming and saying these slogans such as al yom yom al-malhama. Today is the day of revenge. In fact, after conquest of Makkah, because they were derived out of Makkah, right? Imagine you're driven out of your own city. Now you come back to your own city. In this form, people were chanting, al yom yom al-malhama. Today is the day to take revenge. Prophet changed that slogan. I said, no, al yom yom al-marhama. This is not the day to take revenge. Rather, this is the day to forgive and to have mercy and compassion upon these people. He said, Antumut tulaqa, you're free. You're free to go wherever you want to. This is how Prophet dealt in his daily life with people. So four things that I had mentioned, brothers and sisters, as far as the ravish, the way Prophet propagated how he was able to bring these people out of darkness towards light. Magar afsos, کہ جیسے ہی رسول کی وفات واقع ہوتی ہے اور اس وفات کے ساتھ جیسے رسول اس دنیا سے گئے ویسے ہی امت نے رسول کی ان گران قدر زحمتوں کو بھلا دیا رسول جو کہ جانے سے پہلے لوگوں سے یہ طلب کر رہے ہیں کہ کیا میں تمہارا اچھا رسول تھا کیا تم مجھ سے راضی ہو کیا میری گردن پہ کسی کا حق ہے سب نے کہا نہیں رسول اللہ اگر ہے تو ہم سب کی گردنوں کے اوپر آپ کا حق ہے جو آپ ہمارے لیے کر کے گئے ہیں یہ وہ کلمات ہیں کہ جو رسول نے لوگوں نے اعتراف کیا ہے ان چیزوں کا لیکن اس کے باوجود جب رسول اس دنیا سے گزرتے ہیں زیادہ وقت نہیں گزرتا کہ کس طریقے سے رسول کے خاندان کے اوپر مصیبتوں کا ایک طوفان کھڑا ہوتا ہے رسول نے جاتے وقت صاف صاف فرما دیا انی تارکم فی مستقب کہ میں تمہارے درمیان دو چیزیں چھوڑ کے جا رہا ہوں اور یہ دونوں چیزیں پلٹ کے میرے پاس آئیں گی روز قیامت روز حشر دوسری چیز اللہ اسلوکم علیہ اجرا اللہ المبد تفلقم تم تو کیا اجر رسالت دو گے ہاں اگر کچھ کرنا ہی ہے تو میری قرابت داروں کے ساتھ مبدت اور محبت کے ساتھ پیشا بس یہ رسول کی ڈیمانڈ تھی جانے سے پہلے یہاں رسول کی آنکھیں بند ہوتی ہیں ادھر جناب فاطمہ کے اوپر مصائب اور علام کا سلسلہ شروع ہوتا ہے ابھی زیادہ وقت نہیں گزرا ہے وہ آپ نے باتیں بار بار سنی ہیں کہ جب رسول اللہ اس دنیا سے جا رہے تھے تو دیکھا کہ یقیناً بیٹی ہے اور بیٹی غم و علم کی عالم میں ہے لیکن ایک دفعہ دیکھا کہ جناب سیدہ مسکرائیں جب بعد میں دریافت کیا کہ آپ کے مسکرانے کی کیا وجہ تھی تو کہا رسول نے یہ بشارت دی کہ تم سب سے پہلے مجھ سے آ کے ملو گی ہاں جانے کا تو غم ہے کہ بابا اس دنیا سے جا رہے ہیں لیکن یہ بھی ساتھ کہہ گئے کہ تم سب سے پہلے مجھ سے آ کے ملو گی بس اس چیز سے جناب سیدہ ہم میں سے کتنے لوگ ہیں 
کہ جو اپنی موت کا پیغام سن کر مسکرائیں جناب سیدہ وہ ہیں کہ جو اپنی موت کا پیغام سن کر مسکرا رہے ہیں لیکن کیا جناب سیدہ نے اس چیز کو تصور کیا تھا کہ یہ موت کس طریقے سے واقع ہوگی یعنی یہ وہ وقت بھی آ سکتا ہے ان کے اوپر کہ ان کو یہ الفاظ کہنے پڑیں گے صبت علی المصائب لو انہ صبت علی الایام سر نہ لیا لی کہ بابا مجھ پر وہ مصائب پڑے مجھ پر وہ مصائب گرے کہ اگر وہ دنوں پہ گرتے تو وہ جو راتوں میں تبدیل ہو جاتا وہ وقت بھی آیا کہ جناب سیدہ کا دروازہ گرایا جاتا ہے لیکن جناب سیدہ نے عمیر المؤمنین کو صدا نہ دی جانتی ہیں کہ علی ابن ابی طالب کے اوپر پہلے ہی اتنا شکنجہ ہے علی ابن ابی طالب کو آواز نہ دی کہا خودینی یا فضا اے فضا میری مدد کو آؤ عجرکم اللہ اور جب امیر المؤمنین کو لے جایا گیا اور جناب فاطمہ جاتی ہیں اپنا حق طلب کرنے کے لیے جاتی ہیں اور آ کے کہتی ہیں کہ آفا حکم الجاہلیت یبقون کا جاہلیت کا حکم باقی رہے گا قرآن کے نس کو تم نے بھلا دیا ہے ارے میں اپنا ورسہ مانگنے آئی ہوں اپنا عرص مانگنے آئی ہوں آفا حکم الجاہلیت یبقون اس وقت جب جناب زہرہ کو نہیں دیا گیا ان کا حصہ تو جناب زہرہ نے ایک دفعہ کہا کہ اگر علی ابن عبی طالب کو نہیں چھوڑو گے پہلے تو دیکھا کہ جناب امیر المؤمنین کو بھی شکنجے میں ہیں کہا یہ نہ کہا کہ میرے شوہر کو چھوڑ دو کہا خلو خلو ابن عمی میرے چچزاد بھائی کو چھوڑ دو اور اگر نہیں چھوڑو گے تو میں اپنا نقاب ہٹاتی ہوں میں اپنی چادر ہٹاتی ہوں امیر المؤمنین نے جناب فاطمہ کی طرف روح کیا سلمان فارسی سے کہا اے سلمان فاطمہ کو یہاں سے لے جاؤ میں دیکھ رہا ہوں کہ مدینہ کے ارد گرد ایک عذاب گھیر رہا ہے میں نہیں چاہتا تاکہ میری وجہ سے کوئی عذاب آئے میں کہوں گا جناب سیدہ بابا کے گزر جانے کے غم میں آپ نے یہ سب کیا امیر المؤمنین کی خاطر آپ نے یہ سب کچھ کیا لیکن آپ نے سر سے چادر نہ اتاری آپ کو چادر نہ اتارنی پڑی ارے آئیے کربلا میں دیکھئے کربلا میں حسین کو شہید کر دینے کے بعد سے آپ کی بیٹی زینب پر کیا گزری چادریں چھینی گئیں تماشے لگائے گئے اللہ لانت اللہ لقوم الظالمین وسیعالم الذین ظلموا ایمن خلبین خلبون بار اللہ